All right, guys, I'm going to start today by passing out something. I pass this out to the other class. This is um, an AP free response, an AP multiple choice test that I want you to use to practice getting accustomed to an AP multiple choice exam. Which is only one weeks away. I think one of the most important things you can do to prepare for the AT exam is practice. Get into the flow of how questions are worded, um, how well written the AP questions are. They're very particular in how they word things. Um, and, uh, to get used to the kinds of shortcuts that you can use while taking the test because they do like, they don't allow calculators on the multiple choice section. You're like, well, that's gonna be really bad then. But of course they have to use numbers then that can be reduced and simplified and that allow you to take shortcuts that make it go easier for those parts that do require some math. So it's not that there's not math, but there's math that's doable. But you got to practice that and see that. So this is from 2015. It was, uh, they only allow, allow us to release multiple choice tests to students every once in a while. Um, they have pretty strict controls on how we can, how, how we can access and, and share those. But um, this one was given out for release and uh, it's in the newer system. So I kind of, I kind of like it for that. Uh, what I would recommend that you do is when you get a little free time here and there, do a page or two. You know, you're not going to sit down probably and do it for an hour and a half and grind through it. But do a page or two here, page or two there. When you get a little free time over the weekend, try to get a chunk of this done as well. And then sometime between chapter 17 and 18, I like to spend maybe a half a day just going over some of these problems, just showing you my solutions for it. You know what tricks I've learned from looking at this test, and you know, kind of maybe get you thinking about some of those things as well. So it's nothing more than practice, but it's really valuable practice, I think. It's something to start working on. Um, any questions about that? Free response that's that's kind of a different beast. You just go onto the College Board website, and there's the last 10 years worth of free, you know, AP free response questions with the answer key. So you can do that as well, but multiple choice, it's harder to come by those questions. Generally speaking, uh, my students have always done well on the multiple choice. We kind of lock in a lot of points there. Free response can be where it's more difficult because that's where you got all the writing, and things like that. Um, what else? I'm going to pass out next part of your study guide. We're still, I think, continuing. Yeah, this isn't even it. Still have uh, two sections to go in the part that I handed out to you previously. But we're going to get to uh, section 17.4, which is in this one. Monday? Have like shredded yeah, Monday's got messed up because uh, we got that course fair and the junior thing. So even though we're scheduled right now for a test on Monday, we're going <coughs> to probably do some of that AP stuff with the exam. I not go to section, like the first section of chapter 18, and then we'll do the test on Tuesday instead. Because even though we could do it in a shorter amount of time, it's a Little bit shorter test than usual. Um, I know we're going to still have uh, juniors will still be gone during the first part of it. I just messed up too many people. And of course, administration remind everybody that Monday is half taken until after break. So. I got to adjust that from here to here. Play around with how we're going to use Monday. So, according to the game plan here, we're going to be looking at three sections today. 
Um, section 17.2, super quick and simple. It's one side of one page. 17.3 is kind of a bridge between 17.2 uh, and 17.4. Um, just keep going and see how that, that's going to flow. Get started. We looked at the first law of thermodynamics before. We briefly mentioned the third law of thermodynamics yesterday, but um, I'm going to spend more time talking about the second law of thermodynamics here in 17.2. The relationship between entropy change and spontaneity can be expressed through a basic principle of nature known as the second law of thermodynamics. One way to state this law is to say that in a spontaneous process, there is a net increase in entropy taking into account both the system and the surroundings. Recall that the system is the portion of the universe in which our attention is focused. It's usually the thing happening inside the beaker where the surroundings includes everything else. So that statement, the second law can be summarized here. Change in entropy of the universe will be the change in entropy of the system plus the change in entropy of the surroundings. And if the change in entropy of the universe value comes out to be greater than zero, then we're gonna have an increase in entropy in the universe and that reaction would be spontaneous in that situation. To predict whether a given process will be spontaneous, we must know the sign of the change in entropy of the universe. Sounds like a big task, like knowing what the change in this disorder in the universe is. But you know, if we know that, life is easy. If the change in entropy of the universe is a positive value, the entropy of the universe increases and the process is spontaneous in the direction that's written, which would be the forward direction of that reaction. Reactants going to products. If the change in entropy, entropy of the universe is negative, the process is spontaneous in the opposite direction, the reverse direction. But if the change in entropy of the universe is zero, the process has no tendency to occur and is at equilibrium. Good, just as it is. In contrast to the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us that the energy of the universe is constant, energy is conserved in the universe, first law of thermodynamics, but entropy is not. The entropy of the universe is increasing. The universe is becoming more disordered, more randomized, just falling apart. Makes sense from an astronomer's point of view. If the universe is expanding, then there's more positions, which all the matter in the universe can occupy, and that creates more entropy. If you think about it, did I say this yesterday? I probably said this yesterday. I know I said the second block, but um, you spend your entire life fighting entropy. Life in itself is a fight against entropy. You try to make things organized, 
you know, whether it's your molecules, your cells, your life, your bedroom, whatever, you're trying to organize things all the time. And all you're doing is fighting the universe. And guess what? The universe is going to win. It's going to kick your ass in the end. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The universe is going to beat you. But that's what life is, trying to fight entropy. Consider the uh, rusting of iron. It's a spontaneous reaction where iron metal reacts with oxygen gas in the atmosphere in the presence of water, makes it happen a lot faster. We actually make some iron hydroxide, which then can decompose into iron oxide. Calculating the change in entropy of the system from the standard entropy tables, which we looked at the day before yesterday, it is found to be, for the system, a negative 358.4 joules per Kelvin for the entropy of the system. Which, by the way, negative sign means a decrease in entropy. So if there's a decrease of entropy in the system, how is it possible that it could be a spontaneous reaction? All the law requires, the second law of thermodynamics, is that entropy change of the surroundings be greater than that 358.4 joules per Kelvin, so that the value for the entropy of the universe turns out to be greater than zero. The change in entropy of the universe will determine if your reaction is spontaneous or not spontaneous. So if we want this to be positive, to have a spontaneous reaction. And we know what the entropy of the system is, because we looked that up on the table. And all we need, and by the way, the units on this thing is wrong. This should be a uh, Jules Kelvin, not kilojoules. All we need is for this number right here. spontaneous H or S of the surroundings must be greater than positive three fifty eight point four. to get us to a positive value. Something greater than positive 358 will give us a delta S of the universe that's positive. And if the delta S of the universe is positive, now you're dealing with a spontaneous reaction. So that's the short of it for what the second law of thermodynamics tells us. Um, then we go into section 17.3. And I, like I said, 17.3 is kind of like a bridge between 17.2 and 17.4. It gets a little bit, uh, it gets a little bit wordy, I think, 17.3. And ultimately, it's not, the, it's not the primary way that we approach these problems. The primary way we approach the problems starts in 17.4, the next section. So again, it's a bridge. There's a few valuable things out of here as well, but um, let's just uh, kind of take a look at it so we can get on to the more important 
We're going to be looking at the temperature effects on spontaneity. According to the second law of thermodynamics, in a spontaneous process, there is a net increase in the entropy, taking into account both the systems and the surroundings. In other words, the entropy of the universe increases for a spontaneous reaction. So we've got this little equation here. I'll provide it to you on the test. It's not one that we necessarily use a lot, but that's what it's saying, the second law of thermodynamics. And if it's greater than zero, it's spontaneous. I already went over that in the last section. So if we know information such as the entropy of the system and the surroundings, and they're both positive, well, then obviously they're going to add up to a positive value for the entropy of the universe, and you automatically know it's going to be a spontaneous process. If both of these were negatives, then you get a negative value for the entropy of the universe, and you know it's not going to be spontaneous in the forward direction, although it would happen in the opposite direction. The trouble becomes when you have a positive value for one, like the system, and a negative value for the surroundings. And when they're opposed to each other, the answer could be yes or it could be no. It depends on the magnitude of these numbers to figure out if this is going to be a positive sign or a negative sign, if it's going to be spontaneous or not spontaneous. So it gets a little bit dicier when they're not the same signs. And it's often the case that they're not. So here we're supposed to explore the interplay between the entropy of the system and the surroundings in determining the sign of the entropy of the universe. It says here, we're gonna consider the change of one mole of water from a liquid to a gas. We wanna know what happens to the entropy of the water, the water in the beaker that we're studying, the system in this process. And for the liquid, to go to a gas, the delta S of the system would have to be increasing. It would have to have a positive value. Increase entropy. And then uh, I'm supposed to support the decision for that. So I'm going to say we're going from a, a liquid to a gas. We talked about that on Monday, that when you go from a solid to a liquid, you increase the entropy. When you go from a liquid to a gas, you increase the entropy considerably more. Um, also, if you're kind of thinking of your system here, you got your water here. system there, in order to go from a liquid into a gas, we would have to put some energy into that system from the surroundings. So I'm going to say that um, Increase the volume as we go from a liquid to a gas as we vaporize it. That means there's going to be more positions available. Things work towards having the most possible positions available. Um, going to say an energy entry. It was going to be moving faster, changing positions more frequent, frequently, all that adds to the entropy of the system.
At the same time, we have a change in entropy to the surroundings, everything outside the beaker. And I'm gonna say the entropy of the surroundings in this case are decreasing or negative value. The reason I'm saying that is because the energy is flowing out of the surroundings and into the system. So the universe or the surroundings, everything outside the system is losing some energy to the system. Energy flows out of the system. Thus, we're going to decrease the random motion of the surroundings. in this particular case, you're making the system less organized. By doing so, you make the surroundings a little bit more organized, in a sense. Remember, that is the sign of the change in entropy of the universe that tells us whether the vaporization of water is spontaneous. In this example, we see a common scenario where the entropy of the system and the surroundings are in opposition. Which one of them, in this case, is gonna control the outcome of this reaction, or which one is gonna control the situation? And the answer to that depends on one important variable. Does anybody know? What will determine if that's gonna happen or not? Absolutely, temperature. Just because we have the reactants over here and the products over there doesn't mean it's gonna happen. If the temperature is too low, it's not gonna happen. If the temperature is high enough, it will happen. If the temperature is just on the threshold, like maybe 100 degrees Celsius, you might be at equilibrium, so it might just stay where it is. But um, temperature is ultimately gonna influence where these um, come into play and whether or not it will happen or not. Temperature is a big, temperature has a really big impact on entropy, as we'll see when we get into the next chap, uh, the next section as well. We know that at a pressure of one atmosphere, water changes spontaneously to a gas at all temperatures above 100 degrees Celsius. And below 100 degrees Celsius, the opposite process is true. Condensation would be spontaneous. The central idea is that entropy changes in the surroundings. are primarily determined by heat flowing from the surroundings into the system or heat flowing from the system into the surroundings. And if you have a reaction that has a system that is exothermic, exothermic reactions increase the entropy of the surroundings because the system will be releasing energy and that energy will flow into the surroundings, thereby increasing the amount of randomness. Whereas endothermic reactions decrease the entropy of the surroundings 
because you're going to be sucking in energy from the surroundings into the system and thus reduce the randomness of the surroundings, which is kind of like the uh, diagram I had on the previous page. The impact that an exothermic process has on the change entropy of the surroundings depends on the temperature at which the process occurs. In other words, the magnitude of this impact depends on the temperature at which it occurs. The magnitude of the change in entropy of the surroundings depends on the temperature at which the heat is being transferred. Remember, uh, and this can be an easy thing to forget, temperature and heat are not the same thing. Temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy, average of that sample. Heat is the, the joules of energy. Uh, we usually talk about heat content and heat flow being transferred from one thing to another. So you have to kind of look at the heat and the temperature together. Here it says, the impact of the transfer of, the, of a given quantity of energy as heat to or from the surroundings will be greater at lower temperatures. So the impact of the transfer of the given quantity of energy will be greater at a lower temperature. That statement by itself might not make a whole lot of sense, but if you keep in mind uh, entropy, the units on entropy is joules per Kelvin. So it does have the heat in the numerator and the temperature in the denominator. Entropy is all about the heat and temperature relationship. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. In studying the change in entropy of the surroundings, we find that the sign of the delta S of the surroundings depends on the direction of the heat flow into the surroundings, increases entropy by increasing randomness. But the magnitude of delta S entropy of the surroundings depends on temperature. The transfer of heat produces a much greater percentage of change in randomness in the surroundings at lower temperatures than it does at higher temperatures. So we got one that's about the sign, we got one that's about the magnitude. But this part here, we still got to clarify, I think, a little bit. The ideas can be summarized as follows. If you have an exothermic process and you're looking at how it impacts the change in entropy of the surroundings, an exothermic reaction, like a system that's exothermic, will release energy into its surroundings, a quantity of heat, and we'll do that at a certain temperature. If that temperature is a smaller temperature, it's not quite like my daughter's ringtone. Yeah, I have a really annoying ringtone for my daughter. Um, Somewhere I was thinking of something. Uh, whatever quantity of heat is going to be a bigger impact at a lower temperature, because the smaller the denominator, the bigger this will be. If you get a really big temperature, you're going to decrease the magnitude of delta S. If you get a really small temperature, you're going to increase the magnitude of delta S. So what temperature things take place at is really critical to this. Chances are, if you have a mole of water, going from a liquid to a gas, the quantity of heat that's required is going to be pretty consistent. But the temperature change, uh, the, the, the temperature at which it takes place at is going to be the, the kicker. Um, and the opposite for endothermic processes. Endothermic process means the reaction would be absorbing energy. For the reaction to absorb energy, the surroundings would have to release energy. 
so that the system could absorb that energy. At a constant pressure, heat flow is delta H. So the numerator is delta H. So at a constant temperature and pressure, the change in entropy of the surroundings can be thought of as delta H over the Kelvin temperature that the reaction is taking place at. The minus sign is necessary because the sign of delta H is determined with, with respect to the system. And this equation is for the surroundings and the system and the surroundings are gonna have an opposite sign. So if the system is exothermic for delta H, then the heat would flow into it and delta S would be positive. So this just makes sure that the sign is always correct for the surroundings. That being said, all that talk is basically trying to get us to this one little connection here, which we're gonna carry into section 17.4 and come up with a new equation, the Gibbs-Hemholtz equation, I believe it's called. And uh, they're just trying to really emphasize how heat flow and temperature are related as it relates to entropy. <clears throat> but it's not the normal way to calculate it. Not that we can't calculate it this way. We're going to show you a little examples of that, but it's not the primary way we calculate it. Supposedly now, we can understand why spontaneity is often dependent on temperature and thus why water spontaneously freezes below zero degrees Celsius and spontaneously melts above zero degrees Celsius. The value for delta S of the surroundings changes markedly with temperature. Let's just do a simple calculation here. It's kind of like, just to show that we learned something from this. If the, in the metallurgy of antimony, the pure metal is recovered by a three, by a different reactions, depending on the composition of the ore. For example, iron can be used to reduce antimony into, iron can be used to reduce antimony in sulfide ores of the antimony, where iron would be the reducing agent then. So uh, what we want to do is calculate the delta S of the surroundings at 25 degrees Celsius and at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. So um, delta S of the surroundings. According to the last equation that I boxed on the previous page, that's going to be a negative sign in front of the delta H, which would be given right here in the reaction, negative 125 kilojoules over the Kelvin temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin, which would give us a value of 0 0.419 kilojoules per Kelvin. Um, Entropy values tend to be on the smaller side. So kilojoules is not more commonly used. Actually, joules is more commonly used. So we usually express this as 419 joules per Kelvin. They're both correct, but um, they usually use kilojoules for enthalpy and they usually use uh, joules for entropy. So you see where the, the sign came into play here, negative here, negative here, results in a positive value. So we have a, um, I'll just make a little summary here, a positive delta S of the surroundings, comma, heat flows into the surroundings. Which makes sense because the reaction was exothermic. 
So the reaction is giving off energy and the surroundings would be absorbing that energy, thus a positive value. If we take the other example, uh, now we got carbon being used as a reducing agent for the antimony oxide, a different type of antimony ore. This reaction is endothermic. So the delta S of the surroundings here would again have the negative sign. You have 778 kilojoules here. We're still at 298 Kelvin here. Get negative 2.61. Calvin, we'll probably end up putting that into 2610 joules. This time, we've got a negative delta X of the surroundings. From the surroundings system. Makes sense. This is an endothermic reaction. Where is that reaction good get its energy? It's got to suck it out of somewhere. It's got to suck it out of the surroundings and pull that energy into the system so that the reaction can go forward. But it's only looking at one part of the equation. It's not telling us the entropy of the universe. It's not telling us the entropy of the system. It's just looking at the entropy of the universe or of the surroundings. But that is the part that goes into the next equation that we're going to look at. So that's why they emphasize it here. A uh, little summary here. This will make sense when you uh, start putting into the equation, but uh, if you have one value that's positive and one that's negative, it's gonna be spontaneous at all temperatures if it's reversed. Ultimately, you're gonna have to have a value that's gonna give you a spontaneous reaction. So it's gonna depend on the magnitude and the size of these things. But I think what we're going to do is see how this fits together when we look at the next section. So I'm not even going to really dwell on this right now. But I don't have it on this sheet at all, do I? Because it doesn't really fit there. It is in the next section, though. All right. So like I said, 17.3 is the bridge. It's not really my favorite section. It's actually my least favorite section of uh, the chapter because you don't feel like you're getting anywhere with it. But 17.4 uh, is where the good stuff begins. 17.4 uh, introduces us to the new concept, something we haven't talked about yet at all, free energy, which is symbolized by a capital letter G because we're running out of letters here. Um, and uh, we probably spent half of this chapter calculating and working and interpreting free energy and how that works. So this is a start of a pretty big part of the chapter. And I think you're gonna like it once you get into a, get into the flow of it. We'll still be doing free energy tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So you get good at it. Um, so far, we have looked at two thermodynamic quantities that affect reaction spontaneity. One of these is enthalpy, H. The other is entropy, S. The problem is to put these two quantities together in such a way as to arrive at a single function whose sign will determine whether a reaction is spontaneous. This problem was solved a century ago by J. Willard Gibbs, who introduced a new quantity, which is now called Gibbs free energy. And that's why it's given the symbol capital letter G. 
Gibbs showed that for a reaction taking place at a constant pressure and temperature, the change in free energy represents the portion of the total energy change that is available or free to do useful work. If, for example, the delta G for a reaction is a negative 270 kilojoules, that means it is possible to obtain 270 kilojoules of useful work from the reaction. Conversely, if delta G were a positive 270 kilojoules, that means at least that much energy in the form of work must be supplied in order to make the reaction take place. It also means that if you have a negative value for delta G, it's a spontaneous reaction. And if you have a positive value for delta G, it's gonna be a non-spontaneous reaction, which requires you to do extra work to make it happen. The basic definition of Gibbs free energy is this equation. Free energy equals the enthalpy minus the temperature multiplied by the entropy of the reaction. And temperature would always have to be in kelvins for this. The free energy of a substance, like its enthalpy and its entropy, is a state function. Or a state property, if you prefer. Its value is only determined by the state of the system and not by how it got there. So we can look at the current conditions and figure out what its free energy is. It doesn't care about the kinetics of the reaction. The sign for change in free energy, delta G, can be used to determine the spontaneity of a reaction carried out at a constant temperature and pressure, which for chemists is usually the conditions. We do things in an open room, so the pressure's not changing and we're doing it in the same room, so the temperature is not really changing. So for chemists, that works out pretty well. If delta G is negative, the reaction will be spontaneous. In fact, you'll have a spontaneous reaction with some energy to spare. If delta G is positive, the forward reaction will not occur spontaneously, but the reverse reaction will occur. So it can also tell us the direction of the reaction, which is favored. And if delta G is zero, the system's at equilibrium and it's not gonna favor the forward or reverse reaction. This, by the way, is a uh, no well. You're gonna be making half your decisions in this chapter based just on that little list of three outcomes. Knowing what delta G means is gonna be a pretty big deal. Putting it another way, delta G is a measure of the driving force of a reaction. Tells you how much oomph the reaction is going to have. Reactions at a constant pressure and temperature go in such a direction as to decrease the free energy of the system. Make delta G negative. The more negative it is, the more spontaneous the reaction. Taking a look at the relationship amongst the three main variables in this chapter, free energy, enthalpy, our familiar friend from chapter six, 
and entropy. From the defining equation, it follows that at constant pressure and temperature, um, change of free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy minus the temperature that the reaction is taking place at and the uh, change in entropy for this system. For delta G, delta H, and delta S are the changes in free energy, enthalpy, and entropy for the system. You know, we just spent all this time talking about the delta S of the surroundings. The delta S of the system. This relationship is known as the Gibb Hemholtz equation and is perhaps the most important equation in chemical thermodynamics. That's why we spend half our time talking about it. There are two factors that make delta G negative and hence lead to a spontaneous reaction. The first would be a negative. value for delta H. Exothermic reactions tend to help you get there because if you're trying to get to a spontaneous reaction where delta G is negative, starting out with a negative value for delta H is a good start. Secondly, a positive value for delta S would help you out here because we want to get to a bigger negative number. So if delta S is positive, you know, maybe you have a negative here, and then you subtract a positive value from that, you can get a little smaller, more negative, that would even add to your spontaneity that much more. So you want to get to a positive value where the products are less ordered than the reactants. We want to increase the entropy that leads to spontaneity as well. Now, of course, that's going to depend on the magnitude of these values, if they're in opposition to each other. Uh, and it's going to be dependent on the temperature at which it takes place at, because again, temperature is a big magnifier or multiplier of the magnitude of delta S. So now we have two functions that are used to predict the spontaneity of a reaction. The entropy of the universe, which applies to all processes, and free energy, which can be used for processes at a constant temperature and constant pressure. Since so many chemical reactions occur under the latter conditions of constant temperature and constant pressure, free energy is the more useful way of figuring out spontaneity of reactions. Figuring out what's going on in the universe is a little bit overwhelming, a little bit more work. Usually you don't have the information collected to solve it that way, like section 17.3 was all talking about. So this is the way that we usually, as chemists, go about solving for the spontaneity of reactions. That's why I say 17.3 is just a bridge between the two. Um, so it's not that you can't do with the entropy of the universe. But um, free energy is more practical for us. Let's use the free energy equation to predict the spontaneity of the melting of ice. Solid water going into liquid water. That should be a increase in entropy if it happens. And uh, it's also an endothermic process. It requires that you put heat into it for the solid to melt into a liquid. But ultimately, whether or not it's going to happen depends on what temperature it's at. Um, and that's the, the, the multiplier that takes place. So we've got the value for the uh, change in enthalpy to go from the solid to the liquid change in entropy that's going to take place when the solid to the liquid happens, both at standard conditions of 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere of pressure. And we're going to look with this data down below 
what it is at negative 10, zero, and 10 degrees Celsius, where it's gonna be spontaneous, not, or not spontaneous, at equilibrium and spontaneous. I think the first thing I might do with this is just uh, do an example calculation. There's a lot of data here. You got all the data you would need to figure it out through the entropy of the universe. You got the entropy of the system, you got the entropy of the surroundings. They even have it calculated for you what the entropy of the universe is. That would be one way of doing it if you had all that information. But we've got the delta H, we got the delta S, and we got the temperature. So we can also use the Gibbs Hemholtz equation and figure it out that way. But just to give you an example, um, let's find, because we use it this way mostly, the delta G in standard conditions. Um, so what we're going to do is that negative 10 degrees Celsius. So our delta G would be the delta H value, 6.03 times 10 to the third. Uh, units on that are joules per mole. Um, at minus 10, we've been at 263 Kelvin. And we'd be multiplying that by S for the system, which is 22.1 Kelvin and moles. Coming from the standard table, one mole of uh, solid water going to liquid water at standard conditions requires that much energy or that much entropy change. And if we solve for this, our delta G would come out to be a positive 217 joules per mole. Notice that's the units for uh, free energy, joules per mole, the I. Kelvin cancels out the Kelvin, and you're subtracting joules, joules per mole from joules per mole, and uh, you're left with joules per mole. Anyway, this is a positive value. Positive value um, tells us it's not spontaneous. to have water in its solid form melt at minus 10 degrees Celsius, not spontaneous. If delta G was negative, it would be spontaneous. If delta G was zero, it would already be at equilibrium and it's not melting or freezing. It would be right in there in between. So they've done the other calculations for you here. Here it is at 10, when the temperature is 283, you can take the delta H, the delta S, calculate that it's a negative value there, and that would make it spontaneous. You could look at the universe, decreasing entropy of the universe, not spontaneous. Increasing the entropy of the universe makes it spontaneous. When it's zero, it's at equilibrium. But you basically have this guy or this guy to help you figure out if it's going to be spontaneous. And we're going to focus mostly on delta G, free energy, to help us with our spontaneity. I like the table because it kind of summarizes a bunch of things together. But um, delta G is ultimately for us where it's at. brings us to the last page. We've got an example here. Where we want to figure out the temperature at which liquid bromine 
vaporizes the gaseous bromine. When we know what the enthalpy of that reaction is in kilojoules per mole, and we know what the entropy of the system is in kilojoules per mole, both of which appear to be have, have been taken from one of those standard entropy tables, and entropy table and uh, enthalpy tables. And from that, we should be able to use Gibbs Hemholtz to figure out what temperature this would take place at. So I'm going to use the equation here. And I can make a little statement here. Because I just want to know what the normal boiling point is, I want to know the temperature at which the liquid goes to a gas. The temperature that's the, the boiling point. And to do that, I want to basically figure out what it is in equilibrium between the liquid state and the solid state, I mean the gaseous state. In other words, where delta G is zero. I don't want it to be all gas. I don't want it to be all liquid. I want it to be right at that transition point. And at that point, you'd be at an equilibrium between the liquid and the gas. So when it comes to solving this, my delta G is going to be zero. I'm going to have delta H minus T delta S. I want to solve for temperature, so I'm going to rearrange that a little bit. H equals T delta S. It's where the negative sign do that. We can divide both sides by delta S. And I can plug in my numbers and get the answer. Um, the one thing you got to watch out for when you work with enthalpy and entropy is the units. And note here the units that were given for the enthalpy were in kilojoules per mole, which is really normal. You got to decide on one or the other either put them both in kilojoules or put them both in joules, but they're usually in different units. So uh, I'm just going to make a note. Joules or joules and kilojoules. When I solve for that, temperature, the joules cancels out the joules, the moles cancel out the moles, it leaves us with temperature, and that comes out to be 333 Kelvin. Is the normal boiling point at one atmosphere of conditions or one uh, one mole of the gas, one mole of the liquid vaporizing into a gas at standard, uh, in this case, standard uh, pressure. So with that, we are two oils spontaneously. Any temperature.
Now, this table at the bottom of the page will make a little bit more sense to you. Um, and it's logical if you just think about it. If delta S is positive and delta H is negative, this is negative, this is positive, you're always going to get a negative value for delta G at any temperature, and it will be spontaneous. If this is positive, And this is positive. Well, then it's going to depend on the temperature. The magnitude of delta S will determine if it's negative or positive. So it might be spontaneous at high temperatures, or it wouldn't be spontaneous at low temperatures. And then if they're both negative, well, then it's going to be spontaneous if this is at a low enough temperature. And then if they're both a negative and positive, then it can't be spontaneous at all. So that will make sense when you start playing around with the numbers and you look at how one influences the other and ultimately the magnitude of that. It's at leak equilibrium, but that's that is the boiling point. That's that's you know, that's kind of where, where you anything. Usually it's a transition, you know, but what do you call it when you're at zero degrees Celsius? Is that it's melting point or it's freezing point? Well, technically it's both. It's going, it just depends on the direction that you're going. Um, all right, so that's everything for this lesson today. Kind of a lot of stuff there, but if uh, you're starting to feel it a little with 17.4, that's great. That's what I'm spending a lot of time working on there. And with 17.5, free energy and chemical reactions, that's going to be a big one because that's a lot of what you calculate. 17.7, free energy again. And 17.8 is going to be free energy and equilibrium. So just uh, one thing leads into the next, leads into the next. I think because uh, they got a little time here, I'm going to pass out the last study guide. This has 17.8 on it and a little bit of a, like a, the last two pages are just a, an outline of the notes, like a cliff notes version of everything in chapter 17. Uh, well, it says 16, but it's actually 17 now. That way, if somebody does go out with COVID, they at least have a no time in their hand. Perfect attendance from you guys two days in a row. So you're obviously a healthy lot. Get all the study guide in case you weren't in this today.